Welcome to the 15th week of Kids' Corner. And this week, Miss Claire has prepared a new story, The Brave Young Knight by Karen Kingsbury. It's a story about competition and honesty, being able to compete for a worthy prize. I trust it'll be an exciting story for you that'll drive home a spiritual truth. And then we have the blessing of hearing from Dr. Lovegrove yet again as he continues teaching us on the things that Christians are to love. Brave Young Knight by Karen Kingsbury There once lived a young knight in a village on the west side of the kingdom. From the busy streets to the cozy homes, Everyone in the village knew the young knight. He could run like the wind, carry a dog under each arm, and solve the toughest puzzles. When the young knight passed by, people would smile and say, Someday that knight will be the named the best and the bravest in the kingdom, and the West Village will be honored because of him. One day, the young knight saw a woman bent over under a heavy load of bricks. The young knight hurried to her side. Ma'am, he said, may I carry your bricks for you? Every day after that, the young knight met the woman at the brickyard and carried her load of bricks until her house was built. Another time, the bridge over the river washed away. The men in the West Village puzzled over how many logs they would need to build a new bridge, but the young knight had a plan. The men did as the knight said, and sure enough, they figured out exactly how many logs were needed to build a bridge across the river. But the young knight of the West Village was more than blazing fast, fiercely strong, and deeply intelligent. He was also kind. Once, when the children were out playing, the young knight noticed a boy whose legs hadn't worked since he was born. The knight said, I can be your legs. He put the boy on his shoulders and ran in circles around the field, and the wind whipped in the boy's hair and they both laughed and laughed. The young knight was kind that way. Now, the kingdom was made up of four villages, the West Village, the East Village, the North Village, and the South Village. The king announced that the bravest knight of the kingdom would be named Prince, and everyone hoped a knight from their village would be chosen. A knight from the East Village was said to be so fast that he could outrun his horse. When the knight from the West Village heard this, he practiced his running over and over again. Oh, I'm trying, he told his father, but I'm not sure if I'm the fastest knight in the land. His father smiled. My son, the bravest knight is not always the fastest. Follow God, and he will help you run the race. Word traveled around the kingdom that a knight from the South Village was said to be so strong that he could carry a horse under each arm. When the young knight from the West Village heard about this, he practiced lifting three dogs, then four dogs, then five, but he never could manage to lift his horse. I'm trying, he told his father, but I'm not sure if I'm the strongest knight in the land. Again, his father smiled. My son, the bravest knight is not always the strongest. Faith in God will give you the strength you need. News made it through the kingdom that a knight from the North Village was so smart that he could solve puzzles the village teachers couldn't solve. When the young knight from the West Village heard this, he solved every puzzle he could find. But he never was summoned by the village teachers to solve anything for them. (sighs) I'm trying, he told his father, but I'm not sure that I'm the smartest knight in the land. 
His father smiled one more time. My son, he said, the bravest knight is not always the smartest. Ask God and he will give you great wisdom. Soon, the king called these four knights together. I will stage a competition, said the king. Bravery means many things. You will be tested in speed, strength, and intelligence. At the end of the competition, I will determine which of you is the bravest, which of you will be named the prince of the kingdom. A few minutes into the race, the knight from the East Village shouted to the others, I know a shortcut. Never mind the course marked out for us. He made a turn off the path and beckoned to the others, follow me. And the knights from the South and the North Villages did just that. But the young knight from the West Village stayed on the course and crossed the finish line long after the other three knights did. The second competition tested their strength. The king said, in the lumber yard, find the biggest log you can carry from those I've set aside for you and bring it back to me. When they reached the lumber yard, the knight from the south village pointed to a different pile of logs. Some of those are hollow, he said. We can carry much bigger logs if they are hollow. He nodded at the others. Come, he said, follow me. And the knights from the East Village and the North Village did just that. But the young knight from the West Village found a medium-sized log from among those the king had set aside. When he brought it back to the king, his was the smallest of all the logs, but it was solid. The final competition tested intelligence. The king handed each of the knights a treasure map marked with different puzzles. You must solve each puzzle along the way, the king told them. Find your treasure and bring it to me. When they each solved a few puzzles, the knight from the north village saw that the king was not around. I know a man in town, he said, who can give answers to puzzles, 10 for a dollar. This is your chance, he began as he ran toward the town. Follow me. And the knights from the east and the south villages did just that. But the young knight from the west village, do you think he followed them to go buy the answers to the puzzles? No, he did not. He sat on a rock and figured out those puzzles, one at a time, just as the king had directed. When he finally found his treasure and brought it to the king, the treasures from the other knights were already lined up near the throne. Tallies were made by the king and scores were analyzed. The knight from the east village was fastest. The knight from the south village was strongest, and the knight from the north village was smartest. The young knight from the west village thought he would never be named prince. The young knight saw his father in the crowd, and his father smiled at him. And the young knight knew that even if he didn't win the competition, his father loved him. I have decided on a winner, the king announced and the people of the kingdom gathered around to hear. The king looked at the knight from the East Village. You cheated by running off the course. You cannot be the prince of the kingdom. Next, the king turned to the knight from the South Village. You stole a hollow log from another pile. You cannot be prince of the kingdom. Then the king spoke to the knight from the North Village. You lied about solving the puzzles, so you cannot be prince of the kingdom either. At last, the king spoke to the knight from the West Village. Well done. You were honest and finished the tasks as you were asked. You did not cheat, so you are the bravest knight of all. 
So the brave young knight of the West Village became prince, and with God's help, he ruled the kingdom with good character, kindness, and truth. Because of the brave young knight, the kingdom became the greatest kingdom in the land, and the people of the West Village were honored, and they all lived happily ever after. In the last lesson, we learned that God loves justice, and we are told to do justice. We found this in Micah 6.8, which says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justly? Because injustice is bad, and justice is good. But did you know that there is something better than justice? It's the next thing in Micah 6.8. The verse says to do justly and to love mercy. Does that really mean that mercy is better than justice? Well, it is. Listen to James 2.13. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So Micah tells us these two things. Do justly. That's good. And love mercy. That's better. So what is mercy? Here are some definitions. Justice is getting what you deserve. Grace is getting something good that you don't deserve. And mercy is something bad that you do deserve, but you don't get it. You can see this idea in Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful. What does that mean? He hath not dealt with us after our sins. We deserve something bad, but God found a way to get us out of it. That is mercy. So all through the Bible, you see these two twin ideas. The Bible talks about justice a lot, but it is often paired with mercy. For example, Zechariah 7, 9. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy. Here is another example. In Matthew 23, Jesus was criticizing the Jews. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay tithe of mint. You have a garden, and you go out, and you pick ten mint leaves for your lunch. And you set one of them aside to take to the temple and give to God. That's a tithe. And that's not bad. God told them that they should tithe. The problem is, you are neglecting more important things. Some things are more important than tithing mint leaves. What important things? Well, Jesus said justice and mercy and faithfulness. Over and over again, these two things are in the Bible together. Here's another example, Psalm 37, 21. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. That is injustice. On the other hand, righteous people pay what they owe. That would be justice. But the verse says, The righteous showeth mercy and giveth. That is beyond justice. That is mercy. Jesus told a parable to teach about mercy. It's in Matthew 18, and there is a king. And he has a servant, and the servant owes him a lot of money. So he calls the servant and he says, You owe me a lot of money. Pay up. But the servant says, I can't pay. I don't have that much money. So the king says, then you go to jail. And not just you, you and your family too, your wife and your kids, you will all go to jail. That's justice. This man really does owe a lot of money. Going to jail is the legal punishment if he can't pay. But the servant says, have patience with me. Show me mercy, and I will try to pay you back later. So the king changes his mind. Okay, he says, I forgive your debt. You don't have to go to jail. You don't even have to pay me back. That's mercy. But that's not the end of the story. The servant goes away and meets one of his friends. The friend owes him just a little bit of money. And he tells him, pay up. You owe me a little bit of money. 
His friend says, I can't pay. I don't have any money. Then you go to jail. That is the just punishment. No, the friend says, have patience with me. Show me mercy. But this man does not show any mercy. He says, no, you go to jail. That is just. He has the right to do that if he wants to. But it's not good. Because the king just showed him a big mercy. So the king shows up and he says, you are wicked. I had mercy on you. You should have mercy on your friend. So now you will go to jail. And he did. Jesus is trying to teach us that we have received mercy from God. And so we should show mercy to other people. But here is an important question. Is mercy an injustice? Isn't it bad when people don't pay what they owe? Here is our king again, and the servant who owes him a lot of money. But here comes a soldier with a sword, and he tells the king, This is my friend, and I say he doesn't have to pay. If you try to make him pay, I will kill you. Is that mercy? No, that is injustice. Only the king can decide to show mercy. You cannot force him. Do you remember our two men on the scale in the justice lesson? You owe me money, says one man. No, I don't. You're a liar, says the other man. So a judge has to figure out who is right. And the judge decides, you are right. He does owe you money. But I decide he doesn't have to pay. The judge can't say that. That is a bad judge. That is not justice. A judge's job is to do justice. The man who was wronged, only he can have mercy. This is so important because we are all in trouble. We all have a debt we can't pay. God says that we are all sinners. And the wages of sin is death. This is not about money. This is much more serious. And God is a righteous judge. He's not going to say, never mind, we will just forget it. You can go free. No, God says the penalty must be paid. So what can we do? Well, God thought of a wonderful plan. Jesus came and paid the penalty for us. The penalty is paid so God can let us go free. In fact, it is right, it is just for him to do so. He is not canceling the penalty. The penalty was truly paid. So God found a way to have justice and mercy both. Because God loves justice, but he also loves mercy, and so should we. Do you recognize this man? This is William Shakespeare. He is one of the most famous authors ever. We don't usually quote him in Bible lessons, because his writings are not inspired like the Bible. They are just the ideas of a man. But he wrote something famous about mercy that is worth thinking about. It shows up in a play he wrote called The Merchant of Venice. This is an exciting play, including a story about a shipwreck and a man who is in big trouble, who owes a lot of money because of the shipwreck. The man who loaned the money, he wants his money back, and he is demanding justice. But a wise and kind lady named Portia talks to him and asks him to have mercy. This is a long speech, but listen carefully and see if you can understand it. Portia says that mercy is an attribute of God himself. That is true. God is merciful. And earthly power doth then show itself most like God's when mercy 
seasons justice. She is saying you would be more godlike if you would show mercy. And then she says this, In the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. That is the Bible idea. If God is just, we should all be punished for our sins and not see salvation. Instead, we do pray for mercy. And that same prayer doth teach us all to render deeds of mercy. Those are not Bible words, but that is exactly what Jesus taught in his parable. If you are praying to God for mercy, that should teach you to show other people mercy. Love mercy because God showed mercy to you. Here's one of my favorite songs. The title is Lord of the Small. The words are by Johanna Anderson, and the music is by Dan Forrest. Listen to the first line. It's true. The Bible says God cares about every little sparrow. And he cares about you too, no matter how small or weak or unimportant. I'm sorry we can't listen to the whole song. If you want to do that, you can easily find it online. That might be a good thing to do after you watch this video. But here is the very last line of the song. And this is where the song talks about mercy. When God looks at us, he is full of mercy because God loves mercy. And you should too. Love mercy. That is this week's love command.